2013 is coming to an end quickly. A few days left. Uh, I like to, at the end of each year, um, I like to give you opportunity to talk. Share what God has done throughout the year. Uh, keep in mind, the more you talk, the less I talk. <laughs> so this is your opportunity to hear very little from me. <coughs> Um, I'm going to start off, 2013, um, you know, I didn't really know what to expect coming into the year, I never do. When I was in 8th grade, I had a teacher who scarred me for life. She said, do you realize you will never see this moment in time ever again? It's gone. You'll never get it back. <coughs> I spent years regretting every minute that was going by me. I'm not getting that back. It's gone. I just, and I just wasted that one too. Oh look, I just wasted another one. And I spent all that time regretting what was going by, never doing anything, because I was too busy regretting what was going by. You ever see Miss Lusher? Let her know what she did to me. But I don't, you know, I'm not one of those people uh, that uh, I'm not really a look forward guy, I'm a look back guy. And that's, you know, kind of a difference between people, I guess. As I look back to see how I should do things in the future. How was it done before? Well, I'll do it that way this time. How was it done before? Boy, that was a mess. Anybody else? How did you guys do it before? Um, so looking forward is never really a big thing to me. 2013, I didn't know what to expect. Um, you know, we uh, just been the pastor of the church for only a few months. Uh, didn't really know what to expect. Um, I think God has done some incredible things in this body. I'm hoping that's just the tip of the iceberg. I'm, I'm really expecting God to do greater things in this body. Because I think God is calling his church out. I think God is calling his church to be separate. To quit with this um, blending, this cultural blend with uh, our society. Uh, and I think he's making it more and more difficult to be blended because he wants a people that are his that are distinctly his that are markedly his he wants a people that are his own that identify him in a group of people so I think uh, we're going to see that more more and more. 2013, I think we saw some of that come to pass. I think it's going to happen more and more. Now, I'm going to let you in on a little secret. Uh-oh. Did you know that the United States of America is not the center of this book? Did you know that we live most of our lives acting as though it were? That's impossible. As though the United States of America was central to this. As if, you know, our country somehow has asserted itself, inserted itself in here beyond the measure that we see just in reading. Um, interestingly enough, I, one of the gifts that I got for Christmas was the Patriot Bible, which is really kind of neat, but I don't really see how the one has anything to do with the other. <clears throat> but it's, it's kind of neat because it's got stories about the founding fathers of our nation and, and the, the passages that meant stuff to them and things that they used. And it's kind of neat, but I, I see that as symptomatic of the problem that we have in America today, where the church has identified itself as the American church. There is no such thing as the American church. Well, you remember Paul, he's talking to the Corinthians, he says, oh, this one says I follow this guy, and this one says I follow that guy, and this one says I follow the other. Who died for you? Jesus Christ. So you belong to him. We're his church. We have the fantastic blessing of his church that we are a part of being located in the United States. Because we have so many freedoms here that we just take advantage of. We don't even really see them. I can get up here and talk to you guys. 
I, I can share, I can have this Bible in my hand, I can open up and I can read whatever I want. I have done what is just and right. Do not lead me to my oppressors. And I don't have to worry about anybody coming through those doors to arrest me. And you guys don't have to worry about anybody coming through the doors to arrest you for listening to me. We have so much freedom here that it's ridiculous. We become saturated with it. We become complacent with it. There's no challenge anymore. I was, I was a little taken aback when I was pondering a, a passage of scripture earlier this week. I was actually reading it in reference to um, something that I read online. Jesus says that if they hate me, they will hate you. The student is not above the teacher. So if you know they don't like me, you should expect they're not going to like you. And that isn't really what was distressing to me. What was distressing to me is I can't think of anyone that hates me. I can't think of anyone that looks at me as they look at Christ and goes, yikes. I can't think in my per personal walk, in my personal life, of those that I've offended with the truth of the gospel. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not talking about going out and picketing soldiers' burials. We speak the truth, but we speak the truth in love. The goal is not just to get the truth out there. The goal is to get the truth out there that it might bring life. That it might bring hope. That it might restore people to the creator that loves them. Not to float my own boat. I mean, I can sit down and we can argue all the fine points of apologetics and theology and doctrine. To what end? To what end? Are we doing it so I can be right? Who cares? Ultimately, if my being right has driven someone away from God, then it's better than I shut up. But all too often, I never get the opportunity to drive someone away from God because I don't say anything. And it was very distressing to me. Last week, uh, we had a prayer request for Phil Robertson and the stuff going on with Duck Dynasty. And I'm just going to share with you a little bit on my heart about uh, Phil Robertson. And, and that, that issue is resolved. They're inviting him back in. They're going to do a new season. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> Quite honestly, there's a couple of things that I would address with Phil Robertson. One, as a Christian man, he had no business talking about sex with anybody outside of his wife. He acknowledged that. I blew it. I shouldn't have said anything. You're right. Two, as an American, okay, yeah, as an American, he's got his right to say whatever he wants. You also have to understand he's under contract representing A&E. So they have a right also to do whatever they want. It's a business deal. Don't let it stress you out. People get fired every day. Okay? Don't confuse your rights as an American with your position as a Christian. Because, see, Jesus told Phil that this was going to happen. When you take a stand for a moral, just, and holy God, an immoral culture is going to dislike you. I don't like to be told I'm wrong. Do you? Do you like to be called on the carpet when you blow it? So as a Christian, I am joyful that somebody in this country took a stand on the public stage and said, no, there is a moral law that the God I serve has laid down that I am required to follow. 
And then he read the scripture. He quoted the scripture. Fantastic. Fantastic. Why are we shocked when A&E dumps him and Glad gets upset with him and people start screaming, You bigot! Why are we surprised? That should happen. They do not have the light that we do. They don't get it. The corrupt mind cannot understand incorruptible things. The unsaved mind cannot understand the nature of God. They don't have Him. They don't have His Spirit revealing those things to them. Don't be surprised. And I'll go you on worse. You thought it was bad in 2013? It's going to get worse going ahead. God is calling for Himself a people that will be unabashedly, unashamedly His. You, you think it's crazy, but I tell you what, we're going to start seeing a falling away in the church. You know, we talked a, a, about a month ago about the article that I read. The new big movement in churches today. Atheist churches. And they get together. And they have atheist mega churches. Where they get together and they sing Kumbaya. But no Lord, I guess. I don't know what they sing. <laughs> Kumbaya myself. They say kumbaya twice. <laughs> okay. So people can go and they can sing together and they can fellowship together and eliminate God altogether. And quite honestly, I wonder how it's any different than a lot of churches that we see. Because I've been in churches. I, I did my pastoral uh, practicum to, to, to actually be under a pastor and learn how to be a pastor. Where they did like a six week long series on the animals and the Bible. Dogs are in the Bible. There was no way. How, what, do I, what do you take away from that? What, I walk away scratching my head going, who cares? That's everywhere. God is pulling us, his people, out. Okay? But he's, he's making it very clear. You're either in the boat or you're out of the boat. Swimming alongside the boat does not mean you're in the boat. Being able to identify a boat does not mean you're in the boat. When I was a kid, we used to go out to the reservoir. Both of my uncles had boats. And this was before they found out that those little life preserver belts are not a good idea. Because the belt doesn't care which end is up. <laughs> but my uncles had a lot of life preserver belts. And you'd have to watch. Because when you jumped off the boat, when you came back up, if you were one of the fortunate ones to have your head come up first, you had to watch to see whose feet came up first, because you had to go over and grab them and swing them around. <laughs> But while you're in the water, you always have kind of one eye out for the boat. Why? Because the boat, there was also a skiing lake. And there was a little section of the lake where they would put the boats and they'd kind of stack them to the side so the skiers would know, stay away from this area. So you always kind of kept an eye on the boat to make sure you were safe. Being in the water, I was able to identify which boat was Uncle Don's and which boat was Uncle Ron's. I was able to describe them to you. I could even tell you, well, Uncle Ron's is faster because it's got a 120 horsepower motor. Uncle Don's has only got an 80 horsepower motor. motor. I can tell you Uncle Don's was yellow with a black stripe. And Uncle Ron's was silver glittery kind of sparkly stuff. But I wasn't in the boat. We have a lot of people. And we're foolish to believe if some of those people aren't here. That can describe Christianity. And they can discuss doctrinal positions in the church. And they can tell you the Bible stories. I know, I know Noah. He's the guy with the animals. Moses. He's the guy that stood on the mountain with the thing and threw the things down and lightning struck and didn't he drive a chariot? <laughs> we have people that can do those things. 
I had the misfortune this week. My daughter has a, a friend that we've known since uh, he was two or three years old. And uh, he's 18 or 19 now. Grew up in the church. And she, she confronted him on the fact that his life has no fruit. She confronted him on the fact that um, you know, his conversation is never glorifying to God, very rarely edifying to the body of Christ. And she, she asked him, how do you know that you're saved? Well, I grew up in church, and I know da 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 And she came home, and she was very frustrated, and she was kind of heartbroken, because it's very obvious by the lack of fruit in his life, and not just in the moment, but the lack of fruit for you know, the 17, 18 years we've known him, that this young man doesn't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. He doesn't have God's spirit dwelling inside of him, bringing about the changes that only God can bring about. He's churched, but he's not saved. Do you understand the difference? It's like the difference between a sweet grape and a sour grape. They both look the same. They can both grow on the same vine. But I'll tell you what, when you put it in your mouth, you know the difference. Because remember, when Jesus called the sheep and the goats to him, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we do miracles in your name? Didn't we do all these things in your name? As if that's proof that he was in them. No, that's just proof of the power of his name. They had all the signs that the saved ones did. Jesus said, depart from me. I don't know you. See, 2014, 2015, going on, and this is the cool thing about it. I can say with absolute assurity that we are one day closer today to Jesus' is coming back than we were yesterday. I can be absolutely positive about that. We are one day closer. And tomorrow will be one day closer. Now, what I'm not going to say is he's coming back tomorrow. I don't know when he's coming back. I have no clue when he's coming back. God blessed me with the inability to stress about that. Because I understand it's in his time. And quite honestly, if he comes back now, there's a lot of people that we love that are in serious trouble. I know there are people that I love that are in serious trouble because I have never opened my mouth to them. So 2013, our church has grown. We've added some wonderful people to our church. Those of you that came in 2013, we love you and we bless you. Those of you that were here before 2013, we love you and we bless you. I love this body. I, man, you guys make my job so easy. So easy. I mean, I hear other pastors talk about some of the garbage they have to deal with in their bodies. Some of the political garbage that they have to deal with because of the way they're constructed and people's rights and people's opinions about themselves and, and just the horrible infighting that goes on. And, and, you know, we've been in this church for almost 10 years and I have never seen that. Uh, don't get me wrong. We, we have disagreements. We disagree, but that's okay. We don't have to agree on everything. So quite honestly, I hate this carpet. <laughs> and I don't much like the color of the chairs. But I don't care enough to have a fit about it. Okay? I, I don't. Um, you know, I, I look at the marvelous things that some of the men in our church have done with the wood and the, the redoing of the windows and the bathrooms and the, the cabinets, and I'm, I'm absolutely amazed and I'm blessed. Because it looks so much better than when I first walked in the door. You guys remember that stuff that was on the walls? It was like grease board stuff. And it was ugly. And there was green wainscoting all the way around. And it was ugly. 
And we had our 1970s kitchenette over there, and it was ugly. And thank God we've been able to change those things. But quite honestly, in the long run, those are just surface things. Those are just surface things. And quite honestly, those don't mean a whole lot if the body is struggling, if the people are hurting, if, if there's problems here. Okay, we can have I've been to some beautiful, beautiful churches. Wow, monuments to man's ability to make pretty things. <clears throat> but when you get inside and you see the spirit that's in that church, I'd rather have an ugly building and a pretty body, you know. So, 2013, we've added some new ministries to the church. Uh, we started a wood pantry. Uh, for those of you that don't know about the wood pantry, um, this is the, the brainchild of, of Matthew Oliver. Uh, he said, you know, a lot of people in the valley heat with wood, and sometimes it's hard to get a hold of because it, it costs money. And so he came up with the idea, you know, why don't we get a bunch of them together, get some permits, go and cut down the wood, block it, split it, and when people find somebody that needs it, we take wood to them. Pretty simple in its idea, right? Do you know there's almost nobody around here that does that? Wow, we've been able to bless people just by taking them firewood. And you think firewood, big deal. It, it's, to some people, it's a big deal, especially on cold days. It's a huge deal. We took a load out, oh, I, it was about a week ago, I guess, wasn't it? And, you know, we pulled up at this people's house, and I don't know how many people were living there, but there were six or seven people running around. And, um, they had probably about 35, 40 pieces of wood left, and that was it. And that was what they were using to heat their house. And we were able to take four truckloads of wood to them and, and drop it off and bless them. Um, now, do, is God pleased with us? I, I think he is. Not because we did wood. I, I mean, God's pleased with us because we are obedient. Okay. So we have, we have a wood pantry. Uh, quite honestly, we've seen a lot of men step up to go up and chop the wood. And blah, and some of you guys are beasts. <laughs> oh, we don't need to block that. I'll just throw it on my shoulder and throw it in the truck. <laughs> right. I'm, I'd rather the blocking pieces about this big. And then men that, that show up and, and you know cut it and split it and stack it. Uh, men that are regularly going out and loading trucks and bringing it to people that need it. Wow, fantastic. Um, you know, we have... Uh, the Women's Mentor Program, that's been going on, that's new this year. Um, we, we've had several, we have our ongoing Bible studies. Uh, Jeannie, Jeannie, how long has the Women's Bible Study been going? Good. Good. Vivian, how long? 20, over 20 years. Uh, no. Over 20 years. We have a ministry in this church that's been going on for over 20 years. Still going, still going strong. Women get together Wednesday morning. They do in-depth Bible studies. I mean, you guys think I go into the Word a little bit. <laughs> you guys should see. see. Christy brings home the notes and stuff, and I start looking at that, and I just go, wow. It's impressive. You know, the food pantry is still going. Sally takes care of the food pantry. We're blessing the people in this body and people outside of this body that need something. Uh, our, our pantry, whenever it gets low, Sally goes, oh, by the way, we need some more stuff. And within a week, boom, we're restocked. We're restocked. Youth ministry has taken a huge change of direction. I, get, I, I have the pleasure, Kevin sends me his... Um, lesson plans every week. And I have the pleasure of being able to see exactly what they're going over in there. Wow. Man, these kids are getting meat. They're getting fed. There's no, you know, little bit of milk here and a little bit of milk there. I mean, these people are getting T-bones <coughs> in the Word. And they're being challenged to step up in their faith. To not be these uh, contemporary <coughs> cultural Christians like I was when I was a teenager. Yeah, I was a Christian when it was a benefit to me to be a Christian, but otherwise I was just quiet. So there's some beautiful things that are happening in Jesus Community Church. 
2013 personally. Uh, you know, for me, it was kind of a tough year. Um, you know, through the course of the year, my dad got worse with his mesothelioma and passed away in October. Um, that was tough because, um, you know, my dad and I had a, 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 a kind of a weird relationship. Um, but for 20 some years that I knew him after he came to the Lord, it got better and better and better and better. And you know, some people came to me after my dad died. They couldn't quite understand why I, you know, wasn't all emotional. Well, one, I'm not typically emotional anyway. Um, yeah, I cried. I don't cry around you guys. I try not to. I, I try not to cry around my family. But I determined something with my dad's passing. Do I really believe that what I believe is really real? You know, we've said that before. Do I really believe that my dad is in a better place now than he was? Do I really believe that my dad has an eternity in heaven with his maker, with his savior? Do I really believe that? Because if I really believe that, then my tears are selfish tears. And that's okay. It's okay to have selfish tears, to, to mourn the loss. But I don't have this, what am I going to do? The last words my dad said to me is, I'll see you soon. Yeah. Yeah, well, I hope that he's not talking that my life's going to be I don't think that's what he meant. <laughs> but, you know, Paul says these are just light and momentary afflictions. We're here for a little bit of time. I mean, some of you people, you might even live to be 100. I don't plan on it. I don't plan on it. I don't want to be 100. I'm a little shaky about 50. <laughs> The 40s haven't been real good to me. <laughs> so you know, I'm a little bit worried about 50. But I know that there's a time coming soon that I will be with my dad forever. And there won't be any pain, any sorrow, any suffering. We're going to have it all. So 2013 has, has taught me a lot of stuff. I'll tell you what else it taught me. It is hard to put a message together <laughs> every week. That's tough. Because you get to the point where you feel like you're saying the same thing. Boy, I think I said that already. If I said that already, either you needed to hear it, or I needed to say it. Or I just goofed. So 2013, all in all, I would say it was a very good year. For me personally, for the Body of Jesus Community Church, 2014, I think it's going to be a very good year. How could it not be a good year? We serve a good God. We serve a good God whose plans for us are good. How could it not be a good year? So, 2013, I'm opening the floor. Look, we've got at least half an hour that you guys get to share. And I'm, this is a threat. <laughs> Because we're, we're using the full half hour. <laughs> so, if you're not talking, I am. Because I've got a little <coughs> message up here prepared. So I can, you know, I can put it off till next year. Because it's a New Year's <coughs> message and wouldn't really go next week. So, would anybody like to stand up and share with us what God has done with you in 2013? <laughs> Dennis laughed, laughed first, so, okay, Dave. Um, 2013 was a little hard, and I hate crying. <laughs> um, but not as hard as what a lot of people might think. 
a lot of good things came out of it. Shelly getting sick and a few other things. And you, <clears throat> like when I retired, I thought I was retiring for reasons other than it turned out it was so I could help her. Um, and I, I feel like it, well, made us closer, um, but it made us closer with the body of this church, with all the help and things in it. And uh, this was kind of a big deal for me. Um, Glenn mentioned the firewood bank. Um, it gave me the opportunity to do that. I love doing that. And it gave me the opportunity to help in a way that I could help. And so I, I did that for the church and for some other people that aren't in the church. And um, there's still, still a few things going on with me, nothing serious yet, but um, just putting, it's renewing, putting faith in God and trust in Him. And we have to remind each other to do that sometimes. <coughs> and <coughs> Shelly and I, <laughs> well, I was coming to this church long before I knew Shelly, but not as much. That's where she was good for me. But I, Ever since we were married, we moved back here. Um, we chose this church. And at first, Shelly didn't know anybody. And so she talked about looking closer to home. But I didn't want to. And now there's no way. <laughs> no way we didn't. Not unless we had to. Um, it does make it a little hard for us to come here, but we love coming here and we want to come here. And so far, he's let us come here. And, uh, actually, not, it actually started in 2012 when Dustin broke his neck, and it's been going on from there. So, uh, hopefully, <laughs> it might, that part might be a little bit better. You guys all had a 2013, right? <laughs> 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 yeah, I just simply have to say that, you know, being a Montana resident for 37 years, moving out of state for 25 years and coming back home, basically that's what it was, we came back home. Didn't necessarily want to retire quite as early, but it worked out. So here we are, you know, since we've, I had a lot of uncertainty, you know, it's hard to walk away from a place that you've been at for 25 years, especially the splendor and the beauty, then you're kind of reminded of uh, the other aspects of the state being a very liberal state, and you say, well, ah, you know, let's go to Montana. But, you know, the, the whole thing of it is, it was near impossible overwhelming in a sense that you just pick up and leave not knowing what lies ahead like what you were kind of talking about and of course you know you express your faith 
faith in Christ and love for the Lord Almighty. And it doesn't mean that your family necessarily feels the same way. And of course, unfortunately, I have a lot of family that does not feel that way about anything much less than <coughs> Christianity. So here we are. The Lord has provided and uh, beyond measure. And one thing we've learned, you cannot outgive him. And so the sacrifices you make and the things that you do, he replenishes, you know, back down and overflowing. And uh, that's one thing we learned early on, I guess. And uh, yeah, I've raised a family, you got bills and you got other necessities that come about. But the bottom line is you can't outgive them. And that's what I've noticed, you know, so many things that he's involved with in so many different families and lives, and especially with, you know, people in this congregation. And, uh, well, here we are, 2013, we just had our 43rd wedding anniversary. <coughs> And to be honest, I have to give the Lord the glory because I never thought I'd make it the first three or four. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, and, and I see people that are struggling and people that are having a hard time, and I, I don't know how they do it. I could not do it without help from a supernatural help because it takes somebody that has that kind of might and strength to kind of keep me going in the direction I should be going. Because when I'm left alone to self, you know, the flesh is a, a tough thing to deal with. So all in all, like I say, it's been a it's been a good year. Looking ahead, 2014, I think it's gonna maybe not be so good. Because I have a dad that's going downhill and uh, but I think good's gonna come out of it. But since that time, I have my mother with us, and unfortunately, she has to listen to different sermons on TV and uh, talk about different things. And my wife tends to get fired up a little bit here and there. <laughs> but you know, these people are around us for a reason, and I think we have a responsibility to be able to share that because, like you said, they don't have any idea. So, good year. It's been a good year for us. Physically, we're still hanging in there. So. But it's, I want you to understand, it's not, well, you know, I'm, I'm cured, I'm fine. I'm just saying when you get older, it's day by day, moment by moment. Good days, uh, some days not so good, but they're not bad because you still have breath of life. So. Anyone else? Kevin. I had um, a really wonderful year and a really rough year in a lot of ways. Um, I'm not going to go into great detail on that, other than I had a baby born in June, which was one of the awesome parts. Um, I bless and thank God for that. Um, I thank God this year for the church family here that has so greatly blessed our family. Um, just even just having people to talk to and be close to. And, and uh, on that course, I kind of want to thank God for, um, well, I've spent a lot of time with Benjamin and Christopher, um, particularly this last year, um, spending time with them, getting to know them. And they're really awesome guys. <clears throat> I mean, they're not perfect, believe me, I've gotten to know them. <laughs> but no, they, they honestly, um, they challenged me greatly in my personal walk with God. Um, and one of the things I think that God's been working on me lately, um, and a lot of that through their example, um, is challenging other people. You know, I mean, it's, it's good to be on the right track, and it's good to, to know the things and to, to know that you're right with God and that, that you're uh, following Him and, and all that. But part of our job as Christians, um, especially as mature Christians, um, is to keep other people accountable. Um, and that's a very uncomfortable thing to do. I don't like to do that. 
I mean, I can I can talk to people that aren't saved, you know, and you know feel for them, and, you know, try to tell them the truth and love and stuff. But it's so hard to do to fellow believers, um, and I think that's what God wants us to do as we mature in our faith, especially like I said. So um, I challenge each one of you to keep me faithful. Um, and by look out, I'm going to start doing that too. So, <laughs> but yeah, yeah. God's really blessed me and challenged me and, and grown me and my family this year. So thanks to all of you guys for, for your hand in that. Anyone else? Dennis, way back here in the corner. Way back here in the corner. Back here in the corner. Got here late. <laughs> this is the first time in 20 years. <laughs> but anyway, it's very difficult to uh, come up with something to say when you've had a wonderful year. Mm -hmm. How long does it take to say, God has blessed you for... 365 days. Mm -hmm. uh, the worst I can say for this year is I had a stomach proof for five days. And it's been four years since I had done that. So, <laughs> you know, you sit very often and you're so fortunate that you don't have the different uh, operations. And everybody in my family has already died and needed to be died yet. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to say thank you for all the prayers for our family this year. I know there was a, a lot of them that started this year as three in Afghanistan. We had prayed for me and my wife, and I really appreciate that. And when I went to college, I know there was some prayers there. And this year, was, this year started our third year of waiting for our adoption. And finally, we, we, we got a referral, and then everybody knows we went... We wanted to go to Bulgaria last week and we got to meet him and I'm excited for I'm really excited for him because he's gonna have an opportunity that he's not gonna have there. So we just uh, we just want to say thank you. Yeah. Very cool. What we uh, expect at some point a slideshow or <laughs> you know. <laughs> Good. Next Sunday. <laughs> um, anyone else? Uh, you, you guys have done 17 minutes. So. <laughs> <laughs> now, I just would be amiss if I didn't just take on for faithfulness this year. It was a, a year of change for us. We had another baby and then stopped working for Scott and for a different company, which worked here for seven years. So that was kind of a new thing in my short life that I had already. 
But he, he's just been faithful for us for all the, all the things. It seems like every time something comes up, we're like, okay, God, we have to trust you, and this is always faithful. It, just, it seems like a dumb moment after the fact, but it's just, he's really teaching us that this year. He's so faithful to us. And he blesses us tremendously with his body here, as far as like Kevin says, accountability is fantastic, which is, which is definitely necessary for growth. But the, this is faithfulness, the supply that we need is just been great. So. Anyone else? Thaddeus. Well, I would just like to thank everyone that. Okay, I just lost my train of thought. I have been growing, but I still have some room for improvement. I'd like to thank everyone who has been helping me and saying what I'm doing wrong, how I can improve, and what I can do to be better. And I'm very fond of my biological family and my church family. <laughs> I see twitching, and I'm not sure if that's hands going up or just please don't look at me. <laughs> going once. I'll say one. Okay, good. <laughs> um, we personally had a good family, um, but. I want to go a little into a thank you for the van notes and just the leadership you've provided. Um, not much for public praise, but I really do think you deserve it. You know, coming into 2013, none of us knew what to expect with a new pastor, one that had never been a pastor. We all knew your family and we'd seen the growth, but we just didn't know. And I just want to say thank you. I think because of the leadership that you've given this body and particularly the men, We've seen some incredible growth in some of the men spiritually. Um, just to name a few, Matthew, um, amazing. Richard, amazing. Um, all the youth leaders, you know. Thank you very much. That's, that's one of those things that I, I say you guys make it so easy on me because, you know, I, I shared a while back at the Halloween outreach. You know, I was, I was caught up doing something and uh, there was a, one of the men came in and was having a really rough day. And I needed to wrap something up before I could talk to him. And before I was done, <clears throat> one of the men had stepped up and was talking to him and was just sharing with him and encouraging him. And uh, they wrapped up and I came over to the other building and he was over here and another one of the men was talking with him and just encouraging him. And I thought, what an awesome thing that, you know, there are other people that are willing to step up and put themselves in line. Um, you know, that's really what the church is supposed to look like. We've got it so wrong in, in our, our culture and our identity where we hire a pastor and say, okay, now it's yours. Do it. And, you know, they, you, know you, you read the statistics, 64% of pastors are, are burned out. Because they're trying to do it all themselves. They're trying to do stuff beyond their giftings, beyond their callings. And in this church, man, if there's something that needs to be done, I know there is someone here gifted to do it. And not just gifted, but is willing to step up and, and, and do it. Um, which is great, because that leads me into something we're going to talk about. We need volunteers. <laughs> and some of you, I'm going to tell you, you're not allowed to volunteer. Uh, Manel's in divorce. You are not allowed to volunteer. You guys do enough right now. Matthew, you're not allowed to volunteer. Uh, in your bulletin, there's a sheet. These are things that we're looking for, somebody to step up, to, to take some time to do. Now, some of them, some of them pretty easy stuff. Uh, prepping communion. You break the cracker, you put it in the bowl. You fill the little thing up with juice, and you go, whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. and you don't even have to do the sound effect. <laughs> it still works. <laughs> but somebody that would, would step up and prep that and then after service take the, the things over and, and get them washed up and ready for the next one um, you know there's, there's little things that need to be done we, we would love love to have somebody that would be inspired to do a summer program for the kids for three months do a summer program um, you know during Sunday school uh, Michelle used to do that uh, years ago um, <laughs> Darlene and Michelle did it. Dennis and Jeannie helped out for a while. Actually, you were pretty much involved with it all the time, weren't you, Dennis? Yeah. Um, but we need, you know, we would love to have that. 
And the kids don't like coming in here in the summer. They don't like it. No, he talks and talks and talks. And you can just see their eyes glaze over, kind of like yours. <laughs> but we would like, we really would love somebody to step up and, and, and take a hold of that. Um, we still need Sunday school teachers. You know, we need people that are willing for a one month block of time uh, to, to step up and, and go over and, and teach the kids. You know, we have two to four year olds. There's not a lot of teaching in there. Well, there is. No, 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 no. That's not where you put the cracker. It's in your mouth. But there's, even at that age, there's things you can do. I know when Mackenzie does it, she, she teaches them songs, you know, um, that, that are Bible stories. And they sing them and they color pictures and they relate the picture to the story. Um, you know, the, the five to, what is it now, five to eight or five to nine year olds. Boy, I tell you what, those kids are sharp. They want to know. Uh, they need somebody that is willing to, to commit invest time in, you know, the, the 10 to 12 year old group, or, or 9 to 12 year old group. Again, sharp kids. Their minds are hungry. We need people that are willing to put into them. Um, we need people to step up, you know. We are all parts of the body of Christ, but none of the parts listed is a pimple that just sits there and he's gross. Okay? All the parts are functional. They all serve a purpose. Be willing to use yourself. Be, be used in the purpose that you're called. Uh, you know, we have, like I said, you guys are gifted. Every one of you is gifted. Uh, well, I tell you what, those guys, some of you guys are gifted with chainsaws. <laughs> and they take these, like, four-foot chainsaws, and they're just like, gee, 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 gee. I'm like, I can't get it started. <laughs> Some of you are, we have some incredibly gifted teachers. And I know we probably have some incredibly gifted teachers that we don't know are incredibly gifted teachers yet. Uh, we have people that are, are uh, acts of mercy, that just have compassion. You know, that's one of those ones that I don't have so much. You know, the difference between an exhorter and an encourager is when you do something wrong, the encourager pats you on the back and tells you it's okay. We'll take care of this. The exhorter wants to know what happened so you don't do it again. I tend to be an exhorter, not an encourager. But there are people here that just, 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 you, they exude love. Even when you do stupid things, Vivian will still love you. She still loves me. And she'll hug me and pat my back. Okay? There's just incredible gifts in this church. Be willing to be used where you're gifted. And be willing to find out whether or not you're gifted. Hey, we, we had one lady that came in and she taught the kids for one month and said, never again. <laughs> I am not gifted with that. Okay, that's fine. That's all right. But we know there are a lot of you that are. Okay? Um, we're, we're early. But you know what? You guys quit talking. So I'm going to wrap it up. Um,